I'll tell you a story, a real true life story, a tale of the western frontier. The west, it was lawless, but one man was flawless, and his is the story you hear. Yes, one man was flawless. Let's talk about Wyatt Earp in Hollywood. I got a lot of ground to cover. Let's jump right in with all the questions that I promised you we were going to go over. Number one, did Wyatt Earp hobnob with Western stars? You bet your patootie he did. Uh, he was in The Last Outlaw Town. And a lot of people don't realize this, but Hollywood was the refuge of scoundrels. And Thomas Edison controlled the movie business because he invented all the basic uh, equipment that you had to do to show a film. And he had a group called The Firm, and they controlled everything on the East Coast. You couldn't show a movie unless it was okay with him. You had to pay rentals. And he hated all the French movies that were coming out with the star system, and he wanted to protect Americans from that. So five outlaws got on a train, and the legend says that they were on their way to Flagstaff, Arizona. Don't forget Winona. And they uh, were going to go there to get as far away from Edison as they could and make movies that they wanted to make. Well, as the legend goes, they got to Flagstaff, Arizona, looked out the window, and it was snowing. And so they thought, well, there goes that plan. Let's just take the rails to the end of the line and see what happens there. Well, the end of the line was a little farming community called Hollywood, California. There's farms there. And so they started doing movies, and they, they built these sets with wheels on them so that if any of the Edison goons or the, the heat came uh, to serve uh, warrants on them, they could just uh, put it on trucks and take it to Mexico and wait till it cooled off. To give you an idea of, of how radical Edison was, uh, one of the guys who got off that train had 285 warrants to cease and desist. So that's why all these outlaws went to the West Coast into this little farming community. Well, once the movie started to catch on out there, the stuff that they were doing, and of course they were doing Westerns because that was like, uh, hey, grab that guy right there. They were in the West. And so they were doing these Westerns and it started attracting all these con men. And I love this quote from uh, Zane Gray, who said, quote, I will not say that all of the people in the motion picture industry are crooks, but I will say that all the crooks in Hollywood are in the motion picture industry. So how, uh, Wyatt Earp fit right in. He, he would be on the sets. He would uh, ba basically go there to uh, uh, play poker and to fleece uh, people. And he was arrested for bunco steering and having illegal feral games. And you'd think that by professional courtesy, he would fit in and everybody would just jump and say, though, there's a story to tell. But they didn't get it. His story, he tried to sell it and he couldn't sell it. Um, he was friends with Tom Mix and William S. Hart, both huge stars at the time. I think about this. Tom Mix was making, I believe it was like $7,000, $7,500 a week. Okay. And this is before income tax. So these guys were rolling in the dough. A Bronco Bill Anderson was making 125000 a year, and he filmed over 350 Westerns. He said he, he made them like popcorn. He'd think them up in the morning. He'd write them on the cuff of his shirt, and they'd film them, and then he'd do another one in the afternoon. And so people were getting rich like crazy. So um, uh, he, uh, Earp was on uh, sets with John Ford. John Ford was in the uh, uh, first wave of doing Westerns. And so it's kind of ironic that later in his career, uh, John Ford claims that he used uh, Wyatt Earp's uh, version of the OK Corral. We'll get that in a minute. I got a great letter, and we're going to answer that uh, as we get down to the end of the talk. Um, did he meet, in fact, um, Marion Morrison? And, of course, Marion Morrison was a, uh, a gaffer, a, a young guy that was on the sets of John Ford and other, other Westerns, went to uh, UCLA, I believe he was a, a, a football player, and of course, he, uh, they, they said, that's a girl's name, Marion Morrison. You need a better name. And so they called him uh, John Wayne, a made up name. And he claimed late in his career that uh, he modeled his walk after uh, meeting John Wayne and the way he talked. 
And uh, I kind of think that is one of those Hollywood isms that came up. I'm not sure that that really is uh, actual, but that that's so much of the ERP ethos, so much of the earth uh, ERP legend is based on these kind of like, yeah, I'm not so sure. And we're going to cover those here in the next uh, 25 minutes, okay? Um, how wild was the last Mrs. Wyatt Earp? And of course, we're talking about uh, Josephine Sarah Marcus Earp. And this is one of the rare photos of uh, the two of them together. I don't think there's any other photo. This is at their camp out by Vidal, California, uh, right on across the river from Parker, Arizona. And uh, Wyatt Earp was still a wanted man in Arizona for the killing of Frank Stilwell. He had warrants out for his arrest. So it's, it's ironic that he spent 22 months in Tombstone, uh, but he spent 22 years along the Colorado River. That's where they would winter at his uh, mine out there on the California side uh, of the river. Anyway, um, uh, she had written, she wanted to get rich on this. And so she and her husband hired a mining engineer. His name was John Flood. And uh, to write their story. And it's, so they were friends with William S. Hart and Tom Mix. They used to go to Musso and Frank's, which I believe is still in existence. Maybe the pandemic killed it. I don't know. Al Levy's. And they used to hobnob with all these guys. And so uh, Mrs. Wider got it in her head that they had to have a story with Pep. It had to be clean. And Wyatt had to save a woman from a fire. I'm not making this up. Uh, and so they, their story is dreadful. If you've ever had a chance to read it. It's just awful. It's so sad when you realize that Wyatt Earp led an incredible life and he wanted to cash in on it. They wanted the payday. And we're going to see that that didn't quite work out the way that they thought. Well, in 1976, a book came out called uh, I Married Wyatt Earp. And it had this image on the cover. And of course, it was a huge success because it was a salacious picture of a semi-nude Mrs. White, she's spinning in her grave. That, that There's no doubt about that because this is the last thing she wanted. And so we all thought, the people who love the White Earp story, when this book came out, we uh, uh, I bought it immediately and was uh, read it and here's her story. And she's talking about she didn't have a hat on at the OK Corral fight. Well, a couple of years went on and I was uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, visiting Marty Manning, a radio guy. And uh, we went into a recording studio and I looked on the wall of the recording studio and there was that picture with an ad for Vanilla Fudge, who's a rock and roll group from the 1967. And they were playing at the Fillmore and it had that same picture. And I thought, hmm, something's not quite right here. Well, fast forward now, uh, about 15 years later, actually it was about 23 years later after this book had sold boxcar numbers of copies that come to find out uh, that this was the photo of Coloma. Uh, it's a World War I pinup and uh, probably taken in 1914, we think as close as we can come, uh, at the, which time uh, Mrs. Earp, uh, her name was, she went by Sadie for most of her life, but then she was afraid that that made her, painted her too uh, racy. And so she uh, insisted that everybody call her Josephine, but she was known as Sadie for most of her life. And so she insisted that, um, uh, anyway, th this picture was taken in 1914. She would have been uh, 53, I believe. And so that was the first strike against the picture. And then uh, people started to uh, really study uh, the memoirs. And to make a long story short, uh, it looked as if uh, it was a fraud and a creative exercise and a hoax. And so the picture is not believed to be here. Now, it's interesting that both recent movies, I say recent, it's 25 years ago, a Tombstone and the movie Wider, both dealt with the taking of this photo as if Fly had taken it when there's really no proof that he did. One last little uh, tidbit on that photo is that a good friend of mine, Steve Friesen, bought that picture that belonged to Bob McCubbin, and he paid $2,000 for it last year in the estate sale and gave it to a friend. Now, there's, there's a good friend, and he knows he didn't give it to me. Well, uh, who who made Wyatt Earp famous, and why couldn't he sell his own story? That's a really fascinating aspect of this, because we all have this idea that uh, if somebody just told our story right, it would it would make it would make for good reading. It would it would be compelling, and that's certainly what uh, Josephine uh, Sadie Marcus and her husband thought. 
and they never could get it. If you read their version, I always thought if I could just get to Wyatt Earp's version, I would then see the raw truth. And I, I, I'm tired of reading these books by Stuart Lake and all these other people. I just want to see what Wyatt Earp wrote. Well, to give you an example of how bad the writing is, okay, uh, in the OK Corral section, uh, someone on that writing team uh, got the idea that you had to put crack, at, at capital letters, as in crack of a rifle, exclamation point. And uh, there's a couple of zings in there. I counted 117 cracks in the 32nd fight uh, where we think there was probably, you know, dozens of shots fired, but not 117. And so this uh, lifted the scales from my eyes. I thought, oh, this is coming from the man himself. And it's even more ridiculous than what other writers are writing. And here's how that happened. Okay. Walter Noble Burns, you've heard me talk about him before. He's the one who basically reinvented Billy the Kid. And it was one of the first book of the month club uh, books that came out in 1924, huge bestseller. So now Walter's looking for uh, another hit and he hears about Wyatt Earp. And so he goes out, finds an old man uh, living in a bungalow, rented bungalow in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, Wyatt Earp is too uh, uh, loyal to John Flood. And he said, I'm sorry, I've already got somebody writing my story. So Walter Norville Burns being the pro that he is, was, uh, says, well, then why don't you help me out with uh, Doc Holliday? He's a friend of yours. I'm going to do a book on Doc Holliday. And so Wyatt says, yes, of course. And so uh, Walter Noble Burns' book comes out in uh, 19, I'm sorry, 1927. And it's Tombstone and Iliad of the Frontier. And Wyatt Earp is front and center. In fact, the entire chapter is called The Lion of Tombstone. And Wyatt Earp is livid because he feels like his uh, life story is slipping away and he's not going to get paid. He didn't get paid anything for that. Then he comes, uh, he's out at his uh, place out at uh, by Dow, California, and he's visited by one of his old uh, enemies, or, you know, uh, Billy Breckenridge, who's writing a book called uh, El Dorado. And so uh, he helps Billy Breckenridge write his book, gives him dates, gives him uh, his version of things, only to have that book come out ahead of Wyatt Earp, and it burns the Earps, and it uh, claims that the Cowboys were unarmed at the OK Corral, and they had their hands in the air trying to surrender. So he gets burned by uh, Breckenridge, and so now he's desperate, and he's in the last year or so of his life, and he uh, approaches three writers. They all turn him down, and then an incredible thing happens. Teddy Roosevelt, when he was in the White House, he had a young press aide um, named Stuart Lake. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt liked to have Old West guys come to the White House. And Pat Garrett was there and Geronimo was at the White House. I'm not making that up. And uh, Bat Masterson came. Bat Masterson became a, a sports writer in New York. In fact, the uh, Guys and Dolls, Damon Runyon wrote a short story, which became the Broadway musical of uh, uh, Guys and Dolls. And the main character is named Sky Masterson. It's based on... Bat Masterson. So Masterson's at the White House and he says, and this is a quote, the real story of the Old West can never be told unless Wyatt Earp will tell what he knows and Wyatt will not talk, period, end of quote. Well, Stuart Lake goes, I need to get my behind out to Los Angeles. So he goes out to Los Angeles the first uh, time he can get out there. He looks up wider, finds him in the same rented bungalow where also Walter Noble Burns found him. But now Wyatt is desperate and he says, yes, you can write my, my story. So they are, uh, what he finds about Wyatt Earp is, is that he answers almost every question with three responses. Okay. The first one is nope. Second one is yep. Last one is I don't recall. <laughs> so he was just, you know, uh, so many times men of action, men of men uh, are uh, men of few words. That's, that's not their deal. It's not that, you know, they're not their deal. And then a great thing happens. Wyatt Earp dies. His last words are suppose, suppose. Uh, I'll give you a, a second to think about that and what that possibly means. But then Stuart Lake has the run of the table. He can put any words that he wants into Wyatt's mouth. And one more thing has to happen until the Wyatt Earp story catches fire, and that's this, okay? In the 20s, 
Uh, nobody thought Wyatt Earp had a story. Uh, it was too too scandalous. It was kind of gangish, and uh, it, it was kind of corrupt, kind of a, a thing going with it. And so nobody thought it was a, a Western story. You had to rescue a woman from a fire, an orphan. That was a Tom Mix mode. You had to sing, uh, you, but not, not the story didn't resonate. They thought. Then a curious thing happened: the rise of the gangster movie. And so then you've got these Chicago gangster movies, and they're just the latest, hottest thing coming out of Hollywood. Here's a quote from Ernest Hemingway on November 6, 1920. The Wild West hasn't disappeared. It has only moved. Just at present, it is located at the southwestern edge of Lake Michigan, and the range that the bad men ride is that enormous smoky jungle of buildings they call Chicago. So now the Hayes Code, which has been put in place to self-police the movie industry and uh, have them uh, have values that Americans uh, will not be tainted by, uh, they start coming down on the studios about gangster movies. And now Stuart Lake's book comes out and it's a big success. And the studios go, what if we took the gangster story and put it in a Western wouldn't it be a little less offensive? And now the Wyatt Earp story in the 30s takes off like an explosion. It's like all the gases united and came together at the same time. And we get this explosion after his death. And by the way, he never made a dime on any of this. But Mrs. Earp got to split everything. And she made oh, 40, 50, 60, 70 Gs out of this. Uh, but it's so sad to me that Wyatt Earp never made a penny from it. Uh, another question we wanted to cover here this afternoon is, did Wyatt Earp actually kill Johnny Ringo? You know, late in his life, he uh, claimed that he did. Um, John Ringo, of course, was the arch nemesis of uh, the Earps uh, on the Cowboys side. They almost had a gunfight after the uh, actual gunfight and were uh, arrested on the street before anything could happen. Well, in July uh, 13th, 1882, not far from Rustler's Park, it was 3 p.m. and a teamster going by uh, uh, a grove of blackjack oaks. His dog was following the wagon and ran over and was sniffing the face of someone who appeared to be sitting in the shade. And he noticed that he stopped the wagon and he went over and it was John Ringo. And John Ringo was sitting in these blackjack trees. That, that picture there was taken um, by myself of a good friend of mine, uh, Jeff Morey, who we were at the actual site. And I asked him to sit down there. And uh, if I remember correctly, there were fire ants on the tree. And he kept yelling at me to hurry up and take the shot. Uh, so, uh, but anyway, that's where uh, uh, John Ringo was found. And um, and it was uh, he. the coroner's jury came out and said that it was suicide. His pistol, uh, he had been drinking on for four days. Breckenridge found him in the um, uh, South Pass outside of Tombstone. And... The liquor he had in the bottles was so hot he couldn't even drink it. He tried to talk him into coming with him. He said, I'm going to make it to Galeyville. And the tree was not far from Rustler's Park, which is uh, on the way to Galeyville. And he was found with his pistol and his watch chain, a wound, and an exon wound in his head. And it was deemed a suicide. Well, then uh, Wyatt Earp started claiming that he had uh, waylaid Ringo on his way out of Arizona on his vendetta ride. And the problem with that claim is that that was in March of 1882, and the body was found on July 14th, 1882, so it's almost four months, and so the dates don't jive. And so then you get all the ERP apologists, sorry, uh, who say, oh, they came back from Colorado. They came back from Colorado, and they waylaid him, and then they, they beat it back to Colorado. Well, the problem with that claim is that uh, John Henry Holiday, Doc Holiday, was in court on July 11th, and uh, in Pueblo, Colorado, and he either had a really fast mule because uh, he had to appear in court uh, two days later. Uh, at any rate, I do not think uh, that uh, Wyatt Earp uh, killed Johnny Ringo. Now, in the movie Tombstone, it's brilliantly written, and that's the uh, closure. That's the outcome that we want because John Ringo is the doppelganger to uh, Doc Holliday, and so we just want that closure and Kevin Jar, who wrote that brilliant script. I, I just, to this day, uh, that's just a brilliant scene. And it, it kind of makes you uh, think to yourself, 
Well, if that is not the way that it happened, that's the way it should have happened. Um, so the last question that I want to uh, answer here today is, uh, why did my grandmother think Wyatt Earp was a jerk? Well, this actually is a payoff to uh, what drove me to want to even find out the truth about the story. And here's how that happened. The year is 1957. I'm a young, impressionable kid growing up in Kingman, Arizona. And my grandmother was from an old ranching family down by Steens Pass on the way into New Mexico. And um, I used to love to go to my grandmother's house because she'd tell us how we were related to outlaws. And so I, my parents wanted to go to a date. They went to the American Legion to go dancing and they left me with my grandmother on a Thursday night. And I said, grandmother, can I watch my favorite TV show? And she said, sure. And she never turned the TV on. She was from, like from that last generation that uh, didn't really like TV. And so I ran over in time just to hear that theme song that we heard at the beginning. And if you are um, uh, old enough, I want you to sing it with me right now. Here's the part that got me. Why it Earp, why it Earp, brave, courageous, and bold. Long live his fame and long live his glory and long may his story be told. Well, I was just glued to the TV, right? Because it's my favorite show. And I loved Wyatt Earp. Well, imagine my horror when I saw this hand come out from my grandmother's chair and she points at the TV and she yells, Wyatt Earp was the biggest jerk who ever walked the West. Well, come to find out, she grew up in Rodeo, New Mexico, the boot heel over there. That's where Curly Bill, that's where the Clantons were, that's where the Hazlitts, that's where all the cowboys were from. And so she heard the story from the other side, and they hated the Earps as interlopers, as Republicans, as outsiders. And so that drove me to try to find out the truth about Wyatt Earp. And I hope tonight we've given you just a little bit of what I know about the Wyatt Earp story. Why don't we take a few questions? Here's one I got in the mail, which I love. <clears throat> John Ford gave an interview and he said that the movie, uh, his movie, My Darling Clementine, was based on detailed conversations with Wyatt before production. Although the film is entertaining, there doesn't seem to be any accuracy to what happened, according to the other eyewitnesses of the fight. I wonder why Ford was so off the track with his version since he claims that he got the facts of the shooting from Wyatt Earp himself. Ford was known for being a stickler for details, but this film is sheer fantasy. What is your opinion on this? Well, my, I think there's three things that we're dealing with, and they are, number one, he's plugging his latest film, so he believes in his heart it's based on truth, okay? Number two is he never dreamed that future generations would go over the court data and the hearing testimony line by line, word for word, and study this thing. He never dreamed that that would ever happen. And number three is most people don't care. He knew that. He knew they just wanted to hear a good story. And that, my friend, is why John Ford didn't care. Uh, here's a question uh, from Lisa Marie Harry. Was Wyatt as loyal to Doc as Doc was to him why did Bat Masterson hate Doc? Great question, um, uh, Lisa. And uh, here, here's the deal on that. Yes, uh, they were very good friends. In fact, they bonded on their trip uh, from Las Vegas to Mexico, which we're covering in the next issue of True West Magazine, uh, on their trip to Prescott, Arizona, and they really got on well. In fact, um, Kate Elder, who was uh, Doc's uh, girlfriend, did not like, she was jealous of, of Wyatt Earp. So yes, they really were good friends. Uh, I think Bat Masterson perhaps was even a little bit jealous of Doc and their relationship, but he also knew that Doc had kind of a, uh, I don't want to say a screw loose, but he was a hothead, obviously, and that uh, he saw him for what he really was. And so somewhere in between there is is the real Doc Holliday. Uh, this is a question from Tommy Chirosi. What time in Alaska was interesting? Any quips from them? Oh, why it's time in Alaska. Yeah, the thing about Wyatt Earp, you got to realize, is that the guy was a boomer, man. He went to all the latest strikes. He ends up in Seattle. He gets outfitted. They take the boat. They go to Fairbanks. They have a saloon. They go to Nome. They allegedly came back to the United States with uh, uh, $30,000. That's questionable. It's argued uh, by all of my friends till the cows come home. 
Um, I, I'm trying to think of uh, any of his quotes that I can think of off the top of my head. He wasn't the most quotable guy, okay? Like I said earlier, he was an action boy. and um, uh, But he certainly uh, left an incredible story. And I have to say, long may his story be told. And he wasn't flawless, as the song says, uh, but he certainly was an interesting cat. And I get this all the time. Was my grandmother correct? Was he a jerk? Yes, he was a jerk. But then we're all jerks, aren't we? And uh, if, we, if somebody would only tell our story the way those guys spun that story for him, maybe we too could have a, a TV show about him. Bob Bo's Bill, Bob Bo's Bill, brave, courageous, and kind of screwy. You, you know where I'm going on this. Anyway, I've had a lot of fun. Any more questions? Oh, did, did wife stay in touch with his brother, Virgil? Uh, Tara Davis. Yes, excellent question. Uh, yeah, the brothers uh, stayed in touch. Uh, Virgil uh, went back to Prescott. Uh, we had a big cover story on how he began his law and career in Prescott before he went to uh, Tombstone. And uh, he ended up back in Prescott out at Kirkland, if you know the Arizona area very well. I went out there uh, and visited where his little homestead was. And he was never the same after the shooting in Tombstone uh, just uh, after Christmas in 1881, after the OK fight, when I client and others uh, ambushed him. And they um, hit his, arm, his elbow with buckshot. And the doctors at that time uh, had to sew his arm at, uh, underneath the elbow and above the elbow. And then they just sewed his, his arm back together. So his arm was loose. And there's a great story about how Virgil came back to Tombstone after that. And his arm was just hung uh, uh, loose. He couldn't use it. And he went out on a posse ride. And the Mexican tracker, they were in the ring cons. And they were going across. They had to cross this open area. And he said, we're going to have to go quick or they're going to spot us, these train robbers. And so they were going very fast. And the Mexican tracker looks back to make sure everybody's there. And here's Virgil Alert riding his horse. And it just freaked him out. Anyway, those are the stories I love. You just can't get that kind of stuff. You can't make that stuff up. It's just too cool for school. All right. Uh, it's, it, time's been done. I could go on another half hour, as you know. Thank you. We're digging the dirt. And I hope we gave you some good stuff to remember and to talk about yourself. Thank you. I'm Bob Bozbell.